and we okay we're not doing headphones and three two one and we're live my friend welcome Sebastian um, this is now our well, our second rerun second try the first one was a bit of a failure uh, we ended up too drunk <laughs> to do a decent job of this uh, so this time we're gonna do it again with better audio and things are gonna be more organized um, Sebastian, you've got a bit of a background in, in physics for a number of years, but recently you've sort of moved into the domain of ion trapping. Um, could, you please tell, could you please tell us what, what, what exactly is ion trapping? Well, first of all, it's, it's not that recent. I mean, it's, we are going back 2013. No, it's well, already no, been I mean, this seven you, years. You specifically has moved into ion trapping, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can let us know. So what an ion trap is, uh, it's a device that lets you control uh -huh. single atomic particles, like atoms one by one, basically, uh, and completely isolate them from their environment, at which point you start getting very interesting quantum mechanical effects. Uh, earlier proponents of quantum, mechanical, quantum mechanics theories were saying things like, you know, yes, this theory doesn't make any sense, this theory is completely absurd, mm -hmm. but in practice... We never experiment with a single atom. We always experiment with a large number of atoms, and then the contradictions disappear when you experiment with a large number of atoms. It's some not possible to experiment with one single atom, and, and doing this would uh, result in ridiculous consequences. And actually, the ion trap is the technology that lets you uh, manipulate single atoms and actually see the actual ridiculous consequences uh, experimentally. You can see exactly what? You can the see ridiculous consequences. The ridiculous I think, consequences. I think, I think, I think, I think Schrodinger, the, the, famous, Schro the famous scientist. Who is yes, right, right, right. The famous right. Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger cat. I think right. that's the word is used. Uh, ridiculous. Yes, something like <laughs> this. Yeah. But, but, but for, for our audience, what, what exactly be, do you mean by ridiculous? Well, all the and maybe all you can go into what Schrodinger... But before we do that, can you go and get your lighter? Uh, there's one thing what, we what, what I mean by huh? well, yeah, we should close this door also if we smoke. Well, we'll definitely close that uh, door. Um, and set up ventilation. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Um. Well, what is ridiculous? I mean, all the, all the things that people, all the paradoxes of quantum mechanics, like things which are in superpositions of states, right. the famous paradox of the Schrodinger cat, which is alive and dead at the same time, this kind of thing, uh, right. we can actually see them uh, in the lab uh, using this, this ion trap technology. Okay. So, so prior, prior to, to, to Arctic, um, technology, uh, rather limiting technology. I mean, there's been great leaps and bounds in, in ion trapping control systems mm -hmm. um, relatively recently. And this is primarily down to Arctic. Is that correct? Well, Arctic is one of the most uh, used control systems and one of the most featureful control systems these days. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are many things that limit ion traps. It's not just a control system. Control system is one of the frontiers. But there are many things that make ion traps not work. Uh, to, to it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a multifaceted problem. I mean, Arctic is solving one problem, but there are many other ones. Mm -hmm. and what are these different sorts of facets which are problematic? Okay, so what is the objective? You want to be able to control multiple uh, ions at the same time? Well, one of the problems is that the, the problem is not, in general, very well defined. Like, okay. if you ask multiple different academic teams, they will try to solve the thing in multiple different ways. So one of the problems, if, if let's say if you want to build a quantum computer, one of the problems is defining the architecture of such a quantum computer. And there are many approaches to this, uh, uh, to this way of doing things. And uh, no two academics labs uh, agree uh, with each other. Okay. So while well, ion traps can be applied to multiple different sorts of domains is that correct well there are many domains yes i mean uh, as i said and as i said already i was already assuming that you want to build a quantum computer which is i think one of the very exciting applications sure but isn't, this isn't the only thing that no uh, no i know but what are the different traps. domains then well there is for example quantum sensing like use those those single atoms as uh, uh, as sensors very high precision sensors i mean wh when you're one of the things that make quantum computers difficult is that any kind of un environmental disturbance is going to mess with your, the computation they're trying to run in, in that machine. Uh, but quantum sensing is actually taking this to its advantage and using the qubit as a sensor. Okay. So you can make a very high precision magnetometer, for example. Okay, so... Or okay. you can measure gravitational fields. Uh, you know, lots, of, lots of sensing things. You can, you can make like inertial measurement units with it, uh, gyroscopes, this kind of thing. 
Mm. So sensing is one domain. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we've got and the an, an, another big domain is the clocks, like atomic clocks. Um, you, right. can, you can use those qubits as very stable time references. W- yeah, what's the latest? What's the latest um, happening in 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 this at- atomic clock domain? Atomic clock. I uh, mean, they've managed to shrink the size of these atomic clocks significantly, haven't they? Uh, well, kind of. I mean, the, there was the optic clock project, which just finished recently, that uh, yeah. uh, was about taking one of those room-sized atomic clocks and turning it into a device that can fit into uh, into rack units. So it's was that it achieved? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, now that project, Optic Clock, is is finished now, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So now, now, now your your partner, um, Jordan's, is going to move on to something else now, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, we, we got we got the the quantum, um, uh, well, the timing. We've got the sensing. Mm-hmm. There's computing. Yeah. And anything else? Well, there are some people who do experiments to test the limits of uh, physical theory. Okay, can you expand uh, in well, that? For example, measuring the fine structure constant, this kind of thing, okay. with very high precision, and see if there is any discrepancy, if there is any anything weird with it. Uh-huh. Uh, there, there's this, or, or just you know, better knowledge of it. Uh, right, well, let's go into the quantum there, there computing are, there side. Are things, there are also experiments mm-hmm. that try to, det- try to find, uh, like, a violation of the standard model, like, uh, oh, that was a, rem- recall that that lecture that we went to was it here no no it was in it was in uh, Boulder Colorado the LOCC that was that was in Hong Kong oh that was in Hong Kong yeah yeah, that yeah, yeah that's right that that's was right. the Batayan trap this was a very theoretical oh, yeah. it was quantum a, yeah, information yeah, talk, okay, yes. okay. but this this talk already assumed the you know, the basic uh, principles of quantum of quantum information and then just built abstractions on yeah, top of it. Yeah, there was right. nothing really exciting in there. Uh, yeah, another test of fundamental properties of, uh, of the universe is uh, people try to understand gravity. So they would, for example, put ion traps in free fall and see if there is any. Uh, well, that's fascinating. Funny with it. Yep. I mean, th- th- these devices are rather sensitive, like sensitive to well, any sort of thing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. So, so you're, you're, you're going to drop them down tower. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Isn't isn't uh, isn't that that experiment done in the in the world's largest vacuum chamber, which is literally know, a room-sized uh, vacuum chamber with these massive doors? Mm-hmm. Which well, I don't think I don't think it's the world's largest vacuum te- vacuum chamber, but it's pretty large vacuum chamber. Yes, it's a, it's a it's a large tower, a large a large cylinder which is under vacuum because you don't want air to uh, right. to stop the free fall of, of what you're dropping in there. So it's a f- pretty large vacuum chamber. Yes, and. Um, and then, yeah, you drop an, the experiment in there. Uh, they, they make the joke that you are dropping your physics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, yeah, the idea is to put an ion trap in there and, and see, any, see if, if, like, theories of gravitation hold or not. But how does that actually, how do you actually show anything um, by dropping an ion trap in a massive, huge room-sized vacuum chamber? Well... If if you if you if, dro- if the ion trap is in free fall, then it's not affected by the Earth uh, gravity anymore. It, the right. Gravity becomes invisible, uh, and so they are trying to see if anything, any properties of the ion trap is changing when it's in free fall compared to when it's on uh, sitting on a table. So, what sort of properties are? You, I mean, are they able to detect any differences whether the ion trap is in free fall or not? Or uh, is this just what they're trying? I don't to know. I'm not, I'm not that familiar with, with that experiment. Oh, okay, okay. I can't answer that. All right. Well, maybe we can go into the, uh, the 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 more interesting side of um, of ion trapping, which is the quantum computing side. But before we do that, before we open up that chapter, should we smoke a cigar? We can close the doors can, and all that stuff. Do that. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Okay. Okay. Um, do you want the extractor panel? Do we need to open up all the way? Can we just like um, add the this thing on and close the rest? How much smoke we generate? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Here, here, here is the here is the light uh, the the ashtray that we that we swap. Oh, you know what? 
You take that ashtray, and then I'll get. I'll make another ashtray. Uh, you, you, you can sit down on the camera and like entertain. Where the hell is the? the well, you're going. You can edit the video, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I, I prefer to let it keep running. Where is that? Ah, oh, there's the tin foil. Most likely, I will not take this out. Just take it out. All right. It's boring. I mean, who gives a shit that you are smoking cigarettes? All right. Smoking Wait, and drinking, and those are the most stupid uh, occupations in the world. Uh, the ah. Smoking and drinking are some of the most stupid, stupid occupations of the world. I mean, there is no. They're not exactly occupations, right? Well, not occupation, just the activities. But. <laughs> All right. We now have a. We now have a homemade ashtray. You take that ashtray. All right. Throw the light in my way. You get the net, right? <laughs> you know about underhand throws, all right? Going to ruin your cameras. No, I don't think so. It doesn't matter. So the fan is running, right? The fan is running, yeah. Um, but do you want the door open? Do you want the bathroom door open? Oh, the bathroom door is closed? Yeah, you should open the bathroom well, door okay, and, so yeah, yeah. and run the, and uh, run uh, the extractor fan. Know, open or not. And run the fan, yeah. Fan is running. Door is open. All right. Okay, let's open up the next chapter. The. Um, Okay, quantum computing. So, Sebastian, now there are multiple different pathways to being able to um, achieve quantum computing. Mm -hmm. You know, each of them is difficult, but one of the higher, one of the higher probabilities, or one of the, the the pathways of greatest likelihood of success is that of ion traps. Mm -hmm. well, it's right. one of the one of the competing technologies. Yes. Yeah. 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 Why? Why? Because ions are pretty stable. Like if you store quantum information in an ion, it's going to stay there for quite a long time without decaying or anything like this. And also when you have uh, interaction between, if you make a quantum gate between two ions, the fidelity, like the accuracy of the gate is going to be quite high and higher than other technologies. But that's just two ions. I mean, to, to, to do a realistic quantum computing setup, you'd need to Well, yeah, to but have that, that's the thing. I mean, if you, of course, you need many of them, but uh, if you just... This, this system which has many ions and many operations is just you know accumulation of very simple operations between pairs of ions and um, or qubits in general but uh, if each, uh, each each of those basic operations has a certain error rate after right. you have a number of operations those errors accumulate and in the, in the end you just have noise and garbage at the output of your quantum computer and uh, the amount of garbage that you get amount of noise is less with ion traps than it is with most other technologies no, I see. You can actually see it very clearly. I mean, uh, there was this uh, IBM Q. Well, I think it's, you can still do on it. There's this IBM Q quantum computer in the cloud. I mean, they did a lot of uh, PR around this. Yeah. You can actually use a superconducting qubit machine and run very simple quantum circuits on them. And you can see that if once you're past just a few gates, uh, your output vectors from, from, from your experiment is going to be very, be very far from the theoretical values. And, and this error is, is pretty high for those uh, superconducting qubits from IBM. The IBM Q is not really the world-class machine for, for uh, superconducting qubits, but it gives you an idea that there are serious issues with this kind of technology. There are issues also with ion trap, but they are not as bad. Okay. So I, I know that also Google's got this D-Wave. Oh, but D-Wave D -wave is, is just doing something else entirely. D -wave it's is not, not quantum computing, is it? Well, it's using quantum effects, but uh, it's not a general-purpose quantum computer. It's just same, the same thing as Google, like this, they claim they achieve, as they call it, quantum supremacy, uh, which is basically like a sp speed up that couldn't be achieved on a classical computer. Mm -hmm. But again, they didn't do it on a general purpose quantum computer. They just showed that they had quantum, they had some, some better uh, results for a very specific algorithm or a very specific problem than uh, from a, 
uh, the, the classical computer on a... On a Use the lighter. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. I mean, at what point you call your thing a quantum computer, right? I mean, you could just take a neon li neon uh, neon light and determining the spectrum of a neon bulb to very high accuracy is very high on a classic, very difficult on a classical computer. But a quantum computer made with just a simple neon bulb is is achieves also quantum supremacy because it it gives you the wavelengths with better accuracy than your classical computer. So, but people are not calling neon bulbs cl quantum computers, right? So this, no. is, this is an absurd example, so that, you know, that gives you the general problem with those claims of you know, quantum computing or quantum supremacy, which well, I uh, are, I are not really built on a general purpose quantum computer, but only on a very constrained problem that, that it's only one little part of the story. Well, I mean, I suppose by rather like, you know, can we say more traditional um, definition of computing is like you have an input transformation and an output, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, using a light bulb to sort of determine. Well, yeah, I mean, you can change the current in the light bulb, and then oh, right, okay, then you have an fine. input, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Or the temperature, or something like that. Well, I mean, so. I mean, yeah, but the input is very, very, you know, it's 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 very limited in that way. Yeah. But having some sort of like a, a programming language, for yeah, example. Yeah, but you don't. Huh? You don't. I mean, most of those D Wave, Google, whatever they. Uh, or, they don't have programming the, language inputs. Well, not really. I mean, you can you can change certain things, but it's not like a it's not a general purpose programming language. You no, know? IBM Q can do IBM Q is a general purpose quantum computer, but not not the D wave stuff and not the Google quantum supremacy thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They are more like light bulbs than than quantum computers. Oh, they <laughs> so D wave is more like a light bulb. Basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a program. It's a pro programmable light bulb. <laughs> it's a probability light bulb. Pro programmable light bulb. A programmable light bulb. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right, I see. Well, it, it does something called quantum annealing, uh, <laughs> which is more like crystallization, like something like this, like rearranging things. What does that mean? Quantum I mean, annealing, which is like crystallization. Crystallization of what? Well, it's, um, it's an algorithm which is similar to simulated annealing. Simulated annealing is... Um, Wait, what, what the hell is annealing? Annealing? Yeah. Uh, it's it's when you when you use well, it's when you heat a material and and cool it slowly and then it bonds uh, right. No, it doesn't bond. It okay. becomes it, bec it becomes soft. Well, in mm -hmm. general, it becomes soft because it, its internal molecules are reorganized to uh, minimize energy. All right. Uh, for example, it would crystallize. I mean, well, it becomes soft. It depends. If metals become soft, but but if it's a crystal, then it becomes a bigger crystal and not something which is made of, um, of, of smaller crystals. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's something which is which can be modeled. I mean, if you look at the uh, temperature curve and uh, uh, behavior of atomic particles, mm. it's uh, um, how to explain this. Oh, it, it's so hard to explain. And I'm not. I'm not Feynman. Feynman is very good at explaining this, not me. No, that, that's uh, fine. That's fine. I mean, we we can. Okay. So okay. So so D wave is this is quantum annealing sort of system. It's like a light bulb, basically. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, something like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah how, how do you explain annealing? I mean, uh, yeah. When 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 some some material has has, a, has some thermal energy, when there's temperature, yeah. all all the all the all its particles, it's fundamental. Like like all the atoms, the molecules are like jiggling around. And uh, the higher the temperature, the more jiggling around happens. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if the temperature is high, more molecules have uh, higher energy, and uh, there is more jiggling and more rearrangement of the material structure that can happen. And when you lower the temperature, there is less and less, uh, fewer and fewer of those arrangements, which become of those rearrangements that become permitted because the particles don't have so much energy, so they cannot really overcome like like shocks or other barriers between them. And um, uh, so when you when you cool a material slowly, it would for example it would for example make bigger crystals because uh, since since they had they, they had they spent more time in a higher temperature region, the, the inter jibbing. interactions the interactions that would allow larger structures to form uh, are, are are permitted. Whereas if you cool it more slowly. Uh, on, only like short range interactions are possible, and you get very lots of very small crystals. Um, but people have, have used this this physical phenomenon to build an algorithm called simulated annealing, where you mm -hmm. you try to optimize some difficult problem like uh, uh, 
for example, uh, the optimal placement of, uh, of a certain graph, like if you have, you have certain nodes which, are connect, which have certain interactions between them, and you want to rearrange, you want to place the nodes of this graph in a way that minimizes all the length of the edges between the, the, the nodes of this graph, it's a pretty difficult problem to find uh, optimal positions for this. And the uh, simulated annealing is, uh, is a good optimization technique for this, like you would uh, basically jiggle around those nodes like randomly, and then you would look if the uh, if the, the the move that that has been selected randomly is going to uh, uh, increase or, or reduce the the total length of cabling of the graph. And the total uh, length of what? Let's say the to total length of cabling, like all the cabling. Yeah, all, all the, the sum. The, for example, the sum of all the uh, okay. all the distances between the, the dots which are connected, all the all the, all the all edges, right. and then and then you. And then you have some probability of accepting or rejecting this this move if it if it uh, uh, if it increases the, the the length of cabling, which is what you want to reduce. And then and then you decrease this probability slowly, just mm -hmm. like you are cooling a crystal to to make a very nice uh, uh, cooling a material to make a very nice very ordered material very ordered uh, structure. And it, 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 it's actually quite a remarkable thing because this this physical phenomenon that you see, which is a microscopic phenomenon uh, that produces those those, those very ordered materials on a large scale when you cool them properly, uh, can be simulated in a computer and applied to other domains than uh, than crystallizing solids, but can be apl also applied to optimizing graphs or other other types of things mm -hmm. just using this this very basic basic thing. People call this sometimes God's algorithm because okay. it's something which opens a very, very fundamental level in microscopic systems and produces macroscopic results. Like mm. if, you look at a, if you look at a snowflake, for example, it has this very beautiful structure, yeah. but uh, this structure is just built using those uh, very microscopic interactions between water molecules and, uh, and using a certain temperature profile that, that allows or disallows uh, certain motions of the molecules at the microscopic level. And um, that, that simulated annealing. And what uh, D-Wave has been doing is uh, something quite similar. But instead of using classic, instead of using like classical statistical uh, mechanics, uh, which, which governs the movement of those molecules, they use certain quantum effects, which also have this kind of random nature with uh, acceptance or rejection of certain moves. So it's, it's something rather similar to simulated annealing that you can run on D-Wave machines. Right. But it's not a general purpose quantum computer. So we don't, we don't actually have a general purpose quantum computer. Well, we, we have we have them, but they are very limited. To a very oh, oh, limited in the sense that they're really, really so tiny. It's like well, um, there are just a few qubits in them. Yes. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So no, it's so, not enough to be useful. Yeah. So small that it's it's just like a, you know, a, a play thing really. Um, you can do nothing really. Well, it's, it's useful for sensing or for keeping time. Like a one qubit quantum computer is very good at keeping time. That's enough, yeah. It's an atomic right? clock, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose you can go further. I mean, surely you can use a one qubit system to. To, you know, to track stock price or something like that. <laughs> track stock price? Why, yeah, why? prices of stock, right? That's, uh, why, why would you use one qubit for this? Uh, well, we have a mutual friend. What's his name? Um, Graham Leach, mm -hmm. who mentioned this uh, this idea. Mm -hmm. yeah, but Graham Leach, you know, he, he already has lots of very strange ideas, right? <laughs> Not always very... True, 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 true. Well, grounded in reality. <laughs> so, general purpose quantum computer... I mean, no real country has come up with... Okay, well, how many qubits does one need in order to do something useful, for example? I don't know. I don't know. Ask, ask 10 people, you will get 20 different answers. Yeah, you get 20 different answers. I mean, we had that... We, we attended that, that lecture out here where, where Rainer Blatt mm -hmm. and um, um, Wineland, David mm -hmm. Wineland, he came out to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean... Like these guys, even these guys, these guys are the head of the curve. These are the guys are the, the leading, most knowledgeable people about mm -hmm. this sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. and they were just, you know, hands up in the air. They have no idea when mm -hmm. quantum computing is going to come about. Um, you know, the, the, the nearest thing that they could sort of like have some sort of a semi-confidence level was in simulations. Mm -hmm. You know, simulating sort of chemistry bonding you know that sort of thing what about what about protein folding i mean mm -hmm. do you think this thing can be applied towards protein folding maybe yeah all right throw me that yeah, simulation simulation is another you quite underhand underhand <laughs> oh 
watch it. We're doing we're doing a fantastic job at catching light. Yeah, right. if you're, in, if you're going to break it, and it will no, I'm sure. it will blow but, up. But never mind. That's all right. They're rather you put cheap. them in the hot pot. It. Uh. <laughs> 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 what uh, s- stick a lighter in a hot pot and watch it explode? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> that's that's terrible, Sebastian. What are you doing, suggesting such naughty things? <laughs> um, okay, okay. So quantum quantum computing, uh, it's 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 not even worth asking. Like, when does one foresee quantum computing? You know, coming into our a, a general purpose quantum computer coming into our world at relatively cost-effective prices. Mm. I mean, this is this is oh, like it won't, be, it won't be cost-effective for sure. That that's not not well. Actually, I mean, the, actually, the first devices won't be that. That's that's guaranteed. No, well, sure, not the first devices, but I mean, do do you ever foresee this thing um, being a sort of uh, you know a, a quantum computer on everybody's desktop? No, I don't. I don't think so. Why not? The sets of problems that you can solve with quantum computers are just a bit restricted. It's not like you're not what, like traveling sales, m- traveling sales. Well, yeah, this kind of thing it could, could solve this kind uh, of thing. PNP kind but of problems. You mean you, you are not going to like run a web browser on something or run a video game or anything like this? It's not really useful for that. I mean, it could be useful for solving certain problems internal to those applications, like maybe you know, if, if you want to accelerate certain processing, even in video ga- in a, even in a video game, maybe some graphics operations might be. Might. Oh, I, say, I, I said might. I mean, okay. I'm not going to. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Might, be, might be possible to accelerate to the quantum computer, but uh, it, won't, it would only, in any case, only be a small part of the application. So maybe there would be a quantum coprocessor included in a computer in some very far future that could speed up certain things. But uh, this, this quantum coprocessor would always be assisted by a classical computer to, yeah. to run the bulk of the application. Yeah. So from a so from a high high sort of general level pos- point of view, what are the major components that go into building a quantum computer? Now, like like I really don't want to keep this like you know like you see so many of these quantum computing companies, and 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 thanks to what what's it the bullshit detector? The quantum bullshit the detector quantum on, on Twitter. Quantum bullshit yeah. detector on Twitter, oh, which thanks. is not me. <laughs> Why do some people suspect it's you? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> I mean, ah, uh, thanks to that guy that, that or that whoever that is, um, calling bullshit on on so many of these companies at the mm-hmm. moment. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. just it's an inundation of bullshit that's coming out here in the quantum yeah, yeah, computing sure. world. Um, Every time there's something fashionable or something, then you know, bullshitters flock to it. Yeah. 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 And and I'm. Um, so all of these companies are really they're just they're just, they're just milking the venture capitalists, aren't uh, they? Some of them are, I think. Yeah. Some mm-hmm. of them. Mm-hmm. Who's not? Mm-hmm. I don't know. All right. Okay. The problem is that venture capital is just so full of shit that you know, if you're not at least milking a little bit, then you don't really stand a chance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Venture capital is just, oh gosh. It's a road to pain and suffering and yeah, dreams lost. <laughs> what are you building at the moment? Inside there? You've well, got inside a, there I'm y- building something called uh, the Noptica wave meter. Noptica? Why yeah. do you call it Noptica, Sebastian? Well, it's called Noptica. Because uh, <laughs> it's something which is built with uh, no expensive optics and no machining. Oh, I see. Okay. So no expensive optics and no expensive machining. Yep. And what? So so so, what is what exactly is an optica? It is a. Uh, Noptica. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure what it's going to be yet. Uh, maybe it's going to be like a, a YouTube channel or something like this, or maybe called Noptica Photonics. No, 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 no. I mean, this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, no. maybe it will be a website. <laughs> like a, a f- fake organization called Noptica Photonics that will exhibit at conferences different kind of products, which tend to be a bit a bit subversive sometimes, like this white meter. Uh, I don't. 
Okay. Maybe just just this one thing. I don't know where it's going. So I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know where it's going. With, with what is the purpose thing. of a wave? Well, I know there is just an optical wave meter, which is this, but there might be other optical things in the future. <laughs> I just uh, I just haven't decided what it's going to be. And building those optical things take a lot of time, so I, yeah. I don't really know uh, how much how far I can I can push it. Okay. So so what exactly is a wave meter then? It's very simple. It measures the wavelengths of of laser radiation. Why do you care? Why do I care? Because when you're building an ion trap, you need very precisely calibrated lasers in terms of wavelengths. And the reason for that is so you can do what Doppler cooling. Yeah, I mean one of the, one of the, one of the things that you need in an ion trap is to uh, basically get some of the coldest atoms in the universe. And for doing that, you need to use a technique called Doppler cooling, which requires extremely well calibrated lasers. Why do you want cold? Uh, or why do you want such cold? Because if they're hot, some of the uh, other quantum states are going to get excited and then you'll get very poor fidelity in your operations that you're trying to do with them. Okay, so with, with ultra cold, with ultra with, cold, with ultra cold you yes, you are basically in the quantum ground state. So okay, yeah. the only excitations that you get are the ones that you are driving with your other lasers, mm -hmm. not the cooling lasers. You need more lasers, not, not just cooling, but you need... Right. You know, it depends what you're doing, but uh, typical quantum computing experiments, they need like two, three, four, five additional lasers. Yeah. Two, three, four, five, what? Additional lasers. Oh, yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Which adds cooling. a whole bunch of complexity to the, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, to yeah, the scenario. Uh, yep. But this wavelength meter, um, it's one... Of, okay, so at the moment, currently the market has, oh, what, two companies out there that are building... Um, I, think, I think there's really, ju there's really just one. There is really just high finesse. Everybody's using high finesse. High finesse. They used to be Burley, but they don't exist anymore. So what happened to them? Uh, they got bought by X4 and then they got terminated or something like this. Oh, I, I think some of the other wave meters still exist. You can still get some wave meters for like telecom lasers or something like this, but they are, they are not used very much in ion trap applications. It's mostly the dominating wave meter is this uh, high finesse device using FISO interferometers, uh, which are quite annoying to build and calibrate. Uh, Everybody's using this. There is so some minority, so some minority groups. You still use the old Burley wave meters. You can f still find those, or used other other X4 or some of the later wave meters that came from it. Uh, but there aren't so many players on the market right now for wave meters. So as a result, the current wave wave meters that are on the market are exorbitantly expensive. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, they are very really, really pricey. Yeah. So this is a solution to that, correct? Well, it's a DIY solution because it's a DIY. <laughs> yeah, because you can you can build it yourself just using you know barcode scanner, helium neon lasers, and uh, uh, just regular optics, and no machining, no fancy things. There. In other words, in other words, you're you're able to bring this the con well this 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 a wave meter from the domain of very expensive, uh, which is only you know attainable by expensive research, uh, well-funded research institutes mm -hmm. um, down to like hackerspace level, uh, advanced hackerspace well, levels it could really? Be more like yeah, kind of like a hobbyist thing or for, for hobbyists or for, yeah. or for like um, academic labs that want to build their own thing. Basically, you just, the idea of this wave meter, you just buy a bunch of, you know, low-cost Chinese optics and uh, some helium neon tubes from eBay, a bunch of electronics like an SDR and some software and then you have a pretty good wave meter. I think it's something that you're going to build yourself. I, I don't really think I want to make it to make it into a product. Maybe not. The reason for that is just it's just so much drama and headache into turning into yeah, a product. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay, and that's because it. Because like I would have to align everything. I have to apply, I would have to like you know machine a proper like optical breadboard, put all those optics in there, align them, then I ship it, and when the when the package arrives, it's out of align. everything's out of alignment. <laughs> yeah, there can be a lot of drama associated with this. Maybe I can maybe make it a DIY kit. Like people have to assemble the optics and align, align them themselves. Maybe that's maybe that's doable. But anyway, for now I would have to make it work well in the first place, which it doesn't right now. Still, still need some work. So let's see. Let's see where that goes. Just but like. Just like very much the rest of Noptica, I don't really know where it's going. It's like the rest of what? Of Noptica, I don't really know where it's going. Oh, I see. Maybe it's going to be a YouTube channel, like mocking uh, <laughs> stupid tutorials. Like, for example, Newport, Newport has this completely ridiculous tutorial on how to build a Michelson interferometer. 
I mean, you know, if you want to be in Wiccan Sound Interferometer, right, you don't, you don't need any fancy stuff, but if you look at this new part tutorial, they will use, like, those Pico motor, uh, piezo, uh, piezo alignment system, which are vacuum compatible, with, like, this console, with joysticks and everything to, like, realign this, this Wiccan Sound Interferometer. And they use this very expensive screen and, and helium neon laser that they sell. It's, it's like a lot of crap, because if you want to build the Mikkel Sun interferometer, uh, you can just take a green laser pointer, you know, that's five dollars, not, uh, not like their helium neon laser they sell for like several thousand. Uh, you don't need any of those Pico motors which cost like maybe ten thousand dollars of, 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 of translation stages and, 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 and motorized months and everything. We just, you know, you can just take some, some uh, blue tack and some mirrors and stick it there. It's not hard to align a Michelson right. interferometer at all. Right. Uh, you don't need any of this, of, of this stuff. Uh, so maybe I want to make like a YouTube video channel, uh, Noptica Photonics, that <laughs> builds, that follows the, the, the Newport tutorial, but instead of, uh, <laughs> of using also each of these expensive parts, for example, it's say, oh, we are going to use the Pico Motor translation stage with this uh, uh, anti-reflection coated uh, 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 beam splitter. Then yeah, we just take some, 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 some cheap mirror and smash it on the floor, then put some, some uh, drain cleaner to remove some of the mirror coating to turn it into a beam splitter. And, uh, and, and and then stick it on the on, on just a, you know some piece of wood with some blue tack and here we have our beam splitter uh, vacuum compatible with Pico motor front lesson stage and, and alignment <laughs> optic but you know and you 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 you, you, you can run this commentary but you, what what you show is just a smashing a mirror on the floor and pouring drain cleaner on it to make it into this, this kind of stuff right and, and and you know this is the kind of stuff that I want to make on the Noptic of Photonics YouTube channel but not just not just a Michelson interferometer you know like for example make a iodine stabilizer helium neon laser <laughs> the, uh, you know all kind of very qu pretty advanced optical experiments that you know that people think are always going to be very expensive but make them in a very punk way using a lot of Chinese components and a bunch of hacks and blue tacks and, and SDRs and all kind of hacks like this yeah. and film this and put it on a fucking on a channel. love that bro mm -hmm. Fucking love but it. I, th I think starting with Michelson interferometer is probably a good idea because it's very easy to do. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just don't get this tutorial. It, it, it seems completely ridiculous. Because, you know, uh, it's really not hard to build a Michelson interferometer. And they make it sound like you need all this very fancy stuff. But, you know, if you can't tell a Michelson interferometer with some blue tack, maybe you shouldn't be doing physics. Maybe you should do be doing software instead where you don't have to <laughs> deal with any laser alignment problems. But you're also using a, a speaker. A speaker to... to are you, are you mean in the Numptica wave mirror? Uh, yes, I'm using a speaker as a very cheap uh, translation Bro, stage, th yes. that is about as punk as it gets. <laughs> I mean, that is a fantastic... Well, the thing is that if you want, if you want to get like a proper translation stage or like, like a voice call actuator, it's really expensive. It's like a couple thousand dollars for like professional ones. It's quite annoying. So just stick, uh, take a speaker cone and stick a retro reflector in there and that's, you know, it kind of works. And that vibrates, which gives you the, the, the movement. Mm -hmm. I recall last time we, we we tried to construct a Michelson interferometer, and we used uh, the, the 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 track that a printer, a printer. Has. Uh, yeah, that was that was an attempt to build a conventional yeah. Michelson uh, wave meter. Yes, there there are two different things. By the way, the Michelson wave meter and Michelson interferometer are two different things. Oh right. Mm. Oh, well, I didn't know that. The Michelson wave meter is uh, just it's a Michelson interferometer which has uh, basically a moving mirror and a fringe counter, and then you measure the you put two lasers in there, and you measure the ratio. Uh, of of uh, you measure the, f the the ratio between the the speed at which the fringes are moving in in each laser beam, and that gives you the ratio of the wavelengths. Then when you have a reference laser, and you know the wavelengths of the reference laser, that gives you the wavelengths of the unknown laser. So the but reference the, of the, the, the known the laser would be the helium neon. Yes, yes, because helium, helium, helium neon lasers exactly. are inherently stable. Yes, uh, but uh, the difficulty with this this traditional Michelson wave meter is that you need to move the mirror by a pretty large distance like it's maybe you know 30 centimeters at last if you want to get decent accuracy and maintaining alignment over 30 centimeters without a lot of vibrations or anything like this is rather challenging and it's one of the main difficulties with building this kind of Michelson uh, wave meter and uh, the Noptica wave meter uh, al uh, alleviates this difficulty by not moving over 30 centimeters, but moving only by a couple millimeters using just a speaker cone with the retro reflector on it and using other signal processing tricks to recover the lost accuracy, which is caused by uh, the limited range of motion. So you take more samples with the soft, uh, uh, no, software? No, there, 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 right? there are a lot of things which go in there. It's not simple and I cannot give a quick answer. Okay. So in other words, this process or this, this, this little trick, uh, set of tricks that you're that you're exploiting 
reduces the costs of a wave meter from I what I don't know if what? I don't know if it really oh, okay. I don't, okay. I don't Hypo- give numbers, but speaking, basically it's, hi- it's, it's 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 replacing like a device is a device which costs tens of thousands of dollars in a device that you can build yourself for maybe one thousand or two thousand dollars plus your time. Sounds sounds like a really sounds like a really good mm-hmm. uh, an achievement that mm-hmm. definitely. So there's only one small cigarette. Yeah, maybe you can cut it in half. Should we cut it in half? Do you have Do you have a scissors somewhere? Oh yeah, yeah. There's some. Well, we're gonna have a a man cave on the twenty second. Oh, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah, my wife's also not gonna like this, but you know, we don't care. Well, we do care. We always care about. We our love wives. our wives. Huh? We love our wives. Huh? We love our wives. We love our wives. <laughs> <laughs> you know, man cave time is important too, right? All right. The Noptic of Photonics Gentleman's Card. <laughs> that would be another device. <laughs> Bro, that, that, is, that is another device in, entirely. Okay, so you, you want to create... You want to create something called the Noptica Photonics Gentleman's Guard. Yep. So this is, this is something that we've been having a bit of shit fuckery about. Yep. Um, and the well, idea, it's, it's, the it's, idea it's, is that... It's just a portable Raman spectrometer. A portable... What? Raman spectrometer. Yeah. Raman yeah. Like, spectrometer. Like a pen-sized Raman spectrometer. Pen-sized, like, like, a, like, a, like a, you know, those... What yep. lecturers use, right? A, mm. a pointer, right? Yep. And the, and the objective of this is so that you can point it into a glass. Yep. And if there's a date rape drug mm-hmm. inside that glass... Yep. Well, it will tell you a lot of things. It, it, will, tell you, it, will, it, will, right? it will tell you the percentage of alcohol, the presence of any nasty well, bro, things bro. in there. Okay, it's kind of so thing, yeah, it, it will have a it, little display on it. And, uh. hang, hang about. Hang about. So you don't determine the percentage of alcohol by how much it luminesces, right? It, it will actually, there'll be a little display on this little pen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which will say, yeah, yeah, okay, this yeah. pen has got like, you know... Yeah, it does. Oh, it's a very oh, complicated... It's going, it's going to be a very complicated device. Um, a very what device? It's going to be a very complicated device, yes. Com- oh, it sounds like it. Oh, yes. Jesus Christ. That's, that's, that's why this is very much talking shit right now, because the LED that has to go in there is quite substantial, so I don't know if I'm going to have time for that. Sounds like fun, though. But, but you, you did say that being able to implement a device like this is mm-hmm. is an important step forward in being able to, you know... Oh, you want the lighter? Yep. Okay, up and... Success. All right, there we go. We managed to successfully catch a lighter. Um, you did mention that being able to implement this gentleman's guard um, is an important step towards, like, you know, like, um, uh, at least the optic side of a quantum computer. Is that right? Mm, not really. Why not? You did mention why, why would it, it be? Why, why would it be interesting? Why, you mentioned that to me once. Really? Oh, yeah. Um, you mentioned that the, the technology invo- that goes into that is, uh, mm, has, you know, not, well, bearing. It's, it's, it's just being able to make small optics and high quality small optics. That's true. Just that in itself is already a significant achievement, mm. but 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 haven't in in the process of making this, are you not drawing from the telecommunications world? Because what I'm seeing now in, within the ion trapping world, it's like they're stuck in the dark ages with with optics, um, in the sense that they've got this massive optics table. Whereas the telecommunications world, they've got a, a, just a tiny tiny little SPF. Device. SFP. Yeah. Mm-hmm. S- SFP, sorry. A tiny little SFP device, mm. which does what you could say the equivalent of, of, of an entire optics table does, right? Well, I wouldn't say an equivalent of an anti optic table, but it, it could do a lot of things that uh, are done in rather well, in inefficient and bulky and expensive ways. In, in uh, So, what's wrong with the iron trapping world? Well, the problem is that um, um, there isn't that much R&D that goes into lasers. So. I mean, these these research institutes get loads of funding, bro. Well, yes, and and they they do make similar lasers actually as the as the lasers which uh, are used same same technology which is used in the uh, 
you know, telecom lasers, like, like distributed feedback lasers, this kind of thing. Sometimes some research institutes make them at wavelengths which are relevant for atomic physics. But those lasers tend to be still extremely expensive, and, and uh, if they are sold at all and not just used for patent applications or publications or any of the things that those labs are doing, they don't really get out there. They're, they're just stayed confined in this, in this lab, and, and nobody else is using them because they're so expensive or, or just limited to the technology transfer, knowledge transfer, all those, all those little bureaucratic things that those labs are doing. Okay. All right. Well, it's mm. so easy to build. You need, you need a special semiconductor fab for those. So, kind of the investment for making those is quite substantial. Don't we have any of those fabs available here in Hong Kong? Well, the problem is that the f process is not compatible with. Um, so it needs to be a other. custom fab. Well, you know, uh, the substances that the, the materials that you use for making those things are not necessarily the same that you use for what they do in the fab in the first place. So if you start putting different gases or substances in there, you're going to contaminate the system, and they might not like this. Oh, so it's not that easy to convert a fab to, to making this kind of laser. So this is a several hundred million dollar enterprise to be able well, to I don't, create I, I, don't, I don't know how much it costs. I mean, you, you could ask Sam Zilov because he built basically something like this. Uh, I don't think he spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this. He probably spent maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars on his, on his equipment. Uh, it's mostly like second-hand equipment he got from eBay. Still, I'm pretty sure he spent qu quite a lot of money on there. Mm -hmm. probably, not, probably not millions. But yeah, if you, if you if you get this second-hand equipment on eBay, spend a lot of money, lots of time on it, you could probably do it, yeah. Damn. But I should I should I should imagine. Well, I mean, if you, if you're shrinking the size of of the optics to to this this level, I mean, it, it does sound like it has huge bearings on making a quantum computer a lot more approachable. Because we've walked into we've walked into these uh, ion traps in, well, in China as well as the United States and and and. Well, well the thing you you have to see that uh, what what they do in telecom is is basically the the, the laser itself. Like the, the one of the big thing they do is very nice lasers. Uh, <coughs> but there are other things that go in there. Like for example, acoustic optical modulators. If you want to shift the frequency of the laser. Uh, right now, even the telecom, they don't have nice acoustic optical modulators. They tend to avoid this kind of technology by, for example, modulating the laser directly or just putting the, what they call it, the electroabsorption modulator on top of the laser beam, which couldn't really be useful for doing what an IOM does. Okay. Right. Well... Or could it actually? Well, well, maybe, maybe it would work actually if you, if you use the electroabsorption modulator instead of an AOM. If you used what? If you use an electroabsorption modulator instead of acoustic optical modulator. Uh, no, actually, I think if you, if you put a filter after this, or if you just don't care about the extra sidebands, I think you might be able to do it. So yeah, maybe you could do something. Yeah. Mm. Thing is, but I those are very integrated technology. Like, like you're modifying, you're putting stuff on the laser chip itself. So you need the clean room, you need a lot of process, and you can't really change something. The advantage of the technology that are used in ion trap physics is um, you can modify things. You can go in the optics table and, and move the mirrors or realign yeah. things, add components. If you're doing like a highly integrated uh, laser on a chip, then once it's made, you can change anything. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't do what you want, then you have to start over. Sounds like hardware development, man. <laughs> Whoops, that hardware has a bug in it. Okay, mm -hmm. well, what can we do to cover that bug in software, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, <laughs> we know all about that. What with uh, the zinc processor, right? <laughs> Good God, what a piece of what a piece of work that is! Terrible. Oh Jesus! Oh, come on, Hong Kong students can handle this kind of stuff. Oh, good. Layer it on. Layer it on. So okay, okay. Quantum computing. Have we have we thrashed that beast? Have we? Can we go into that further? Like how, how, okay, so, so Arct Arctic, Arctic is just a control, not just a control system, but, but it is a control system in the sense that it is controlling the lasers that go into the, into the, the ion trap. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things. It's also controlling the electromagnetic, um, you can control anything. I mean, you can Sorry? You, can, you can plug whatever you want into Arctic. It's not limited to lasers. 
No, well, I mean, okay. So, what are the what are the, what are the components of of creating an ion trap? So we, we've 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 sort of as had I like said, um, you ask ten academic clubs, you get twenty different answers. Well, I'm going to ask you. And you ask me. Yeah. Not better than those guys. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose. Hang on. Hmm. Well, there is the vacuum side of things. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's only a small part of it. It is a small part. And then you've got your optics, then you've got your electronics. Mm -hmm. The electronics yeah, is it's covered. Easy, it's easy. Just vacuum optics and electronics. Yeah, that's it. Simple. The, well, the ha come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> no, the, these are the generalized sort of simple <laughs> names, right? That that compose uh, into being able to create an ion trap, mm -hmm. right? Anything more than that? It's about it. It's about it. And you have several sort of like peripheral um, cards. For example, ca ca uh, capturing images from the camera mm -hmm. and temperature, as well as, as well as like stabilizers and all sorts of different things. Like for example, like you've got a series of cards that each do certain things. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got your main main sort of Casli system, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the main Kastli card, card yeah. the Casli mm -hmm. card. And now the Casli card, that is the beating heart, correct? Yeah, I could say which that, is, yeah. Which is this core, FPG. Call it the core device, yeah. Mm -hmm. The core device. And then everything, all the peripherals sort of plug into that core device. Um, and different institutes would, would want different things, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, they would just order each, you know, whatever, whatever things that they're looking for. So this architecture that, that, you, that you guys came up with, is it... How, how did this come about? I mean, it's a bit of a consortium, is it not? Mm. This Arctic system. Well, we wouldn't call it a consortium, but we'd call it an anarchy of, of people trying to <laughs> do that. You, call it, you, don't, you, okay, you won't call it an, a consortium, no, it, but it's, an anarchy. It's, yeah. And this is cons and th and this, this anarchy. A, a bazaar, a, not a consortium. It's a bazaar, it's not a consortium. A bazaar. Yeah, it's a bazaar. <laughs> But 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 this bazaar consists of a number of uh, like world class physicists in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got Wineland, who's like a Nobel laureate. What was it? Two thousand and twelve, wasn't it? That's right, yeah, two thousand twelve. Two thousand and twelve, he won he won the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. Him and him and Serge, 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 Serge. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. They got that. Who else is on the? Who else is on that? On that? On that? In that anarchy? There are like uh, Oxford University are one of the big players. Oh yeah, how's Oxford doing in this domain? All well, right, no, they're under lockdown with COVID, so not much. Right. <laughs> well, we everybody, everybody's like pretty much fucked over by COVID. It's, well, it's there's, right. there's, it's there's nothing happening in Oxford. They can't even get to the labs right now. Oh God, are you kidding me? No, we are lucky here. We can still go here and then. No, I don't think we're lucky, work on stuff, Sebastian. I really don't think we're lucky. Every single freaking Hong Kong resident out here is, you know, we're all donning our masks mm -hmm. militantly, dogmatically, sticking on the masks. Mm -hmm. and, and that's going to reduce the R0, R0. Mm -hmm. It's going to reduce the infection rate. It's as simple as that. We had a streak of about 20, was it 23 days? Uh, 23 something, something days like where there was yeah. no local infections. Mm -hmm. That's impressive stuff, man. Mm -hmm. we, we've been importing infections from from other countries for mm -hmm. for so long now. I don't know. Hey, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to go into the this COVID, the SARS COV two yeah, but not, uh, thing. It's, it's 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 a bit it's a bit. Isn't that much crashed. going on? In, there isn't going much going on in labs these days because you know, the scientists can get to their lab right now. Yeah, nobody can nobody can get in. Nothing can be done. It's just a bit boring. I suppose it's a bit boring for everyone in every domain mm -hmm. across the world. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what other sort of things can we go into now? I mean, 
we've, we've, we've sort of gone into ion trapping. We've done quantum computing. We've looked at your, your noptic, noptica situation. Mm -hmm. um, what other sort of domains? You were talking about when you, before, before, before the, we started this podcast, you were off having supper and you were telling me about shooting pens into, into, oh, no, no, you don't even want to go into that. <laughs> shooting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have to go into that domain then. <laughs> oh. Could talk about the consumer be gone if you want? The what? The consumer be gone. The consumer. Consumer be gone. Consumer be gone. Yeah. So like you, this you, is, this so is a, you know, like a Mitch This is yeah. a Mitch Altman TV be Yeah, so you, you, know the, you know the TV be gone, right? It's device made by Mitch Altman. That, I do you know, know it's it. like a key ring and you press a button and it shuts down all the TVs around you. And uh, uh, one day, I was, it was a long time ago, 2008, I think, uh, quite a long time ago. And um, I was part of a hackerspace called TMP Lab in the Paris suburbs. And uh, one day we went out for getting some groceries and we noticed that they installed a system that when you try to steal a shopping cart and you try to cross the border of the parking lot, then your shopping cart cannot move anymore. You try to push and the, the wheels are locked. And uh, we said, oh, how is this working? And uh, we found out that uh, there is a, basically a coil, like a, it's, a, it's an electromagnet, uh, which is buried around the perimeter of the, of the parking lot, which emits a certain signal. And then there, is some there are some electronics inside the wheel of the shopping cart that detects the signal, which is emitted continuously by this uh, antenna on the parking lot. And uh, it's only emitted on a short range, so as soon as the on only when the, the wheel is next to this, uh, to this electromagnet, then it picks up the signal and, and locks the wheel. And uh, we recorded the signal, which is... Uh, How did you record the signal? Uh, it's very simple. You take, uh, take a little, uh, co another coil of wire, and then you take, uh, uh, take an oscilloscope and look at the signal. And uh, when we look at the oscilloscope screen, we, you know, we had those, this little battery-powered oscilloscope, very, very convenient for this kind of field trip. So we went to the supermarket with uh, this battery-powered battery oscilloscope <laughs> uh, and a coil of wire, and then stick it on the magnetic cube antenna and look at the oscilloscope, oscilloscope screen. And we noticed actually that this signal is in, is in the audio uh, frequency range, maybe like, like 5 kilohertz or something like this. And, uh, and then you say, oh, that's actually quite good because we can just take a computer sound card to record the signal. And then... Uh, because the oscilloscope, you know, didn't have memory. It was some, some very uh, crappy device uh, that couldn't record signal. It could show the signal on the screen, but it couldn't record it or anything like this. And in, they, they had some, some pulse-coded modulation thing that was not very easy to decode on the oscilloscope screen because I could, I could only see a few cycles of the waveform and not the whole, the whole se pulse sequence. So, but anyway, I said, oh, well, anyway, it's, a, it's an audio range signal, so we can just, instead of using the oscilloscope, we can use a computer sound card to record the signal, so instead of plugging it into the oscilloscope, I plug it into the microphone port of my laptop and recorded it. And then I'm going to say, oh, how am I, go how am I going to play this back? Well, you play it back by uh, putting the signal back into a coil, and then you, you can lock the wheel, right? And, I, I, and then I thought, oh, but actually, the speaker inside my, uh, inside my, my computer is, has already has a coil that I can emit a magnetic field. And, uh, and, and then, I thought, is, is this magnetic field uh, strong enough to actually make the wheel mechanism lock? And I tried it, so I just played the sound back on my laptop and then put the wheel next to my laptop and the wheel would lock when the computer was playing the sound just because of the magnetic field emitted by the, by the speaker inside, inside my laptop. And I said, yeah, okay, well, that's, that's pretty fun, but we can go even one step further. We can actually turn this into a mobile phone ringtone because, you know, mobile phones also have, also have calls of wire there to, to emit the sound of the, 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 the speaker inside the mobile phone. And, and, and then we transfer the MP3 ringtone into the mobile phone. And then when, when the mobile phone is ringing, then uh, the wheels, which are next to it, are, are locking. So, so then we, 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 we went around and we were so fun with this. So, so we, we could basically control uh, those, those wheels using our mobile phones. And uh, we, had, we had two, uh, two MP3 ringtones. Because actually, if you, if you would pull, pull back the cart, then it would unlock because there was a second antenna that would send the unlock signal. So we recorded both signals and we had two ringtones. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and you know, the, we, we could deter, we could, you know, in, in, there, there were MP3 ringtones and we had two, uh, you know, in MP3 you have this tag that uh, gives the, ger ger the, the, the kind of music that is playing. So we had one punk ringtone that would lock and one pop ringtone that would unlock. And uh, by going in the, then we went on the supermarket on no shopping day 
and uh, locked uh, all the cards inside by having a mobile phone ring all at the same time, like, and then all the cards would lock. It was quite fun. So while and consumers were busy pushing these cards around, uh, you, yeah, you yeah. would walk past them and, and, and then just would hang about. Would you take your mobile phone and like sort of put it near the wheels or something like that? Uh, well, we it would make you very uh, conspicuous, wouldn't it? Well, it was a bit conspicuous. We, we, we would put the mobile phone in, in the sock. Oh, oh and, God. And, oh, and so you would just sort of like casually walk up next to a trolley. Yes. And, and, then, then, and then the mobile phone would ring and the, and the cart would lock. And then, and then you've got this, this, this old lady pushing a trolley and then cart. The car, and then the cart was And it would just lock. And then, and then she would be pissed off. Yes. And then Sebastian would run off. Well, not Love just me. I mean, we are like five people like, going, uh, going around the supermarket, uh, in supermarket uh, aisles and uh, with a mobile phone in our socks uh, ringing and, and looking cards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's consumer be, consumer be gone, yeah. Consumer be gone. Mm -hmm. oh, that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. yep. The thing is that like, we, we've never had anything remotely as uh, technologically advanced like that in South Africa. <laughs> where, you know, yeah, well, if, even, even in France, it wasn't that popular. I mean, only a few supermarkets got equipped with this thing. Unfortunately, they picked one next to our hacker space, therefore we played with it. Tell me about TMP Labs, because this is a bit of a, a, bit of a historic moment in the hacker space. TMP Lab? Yeah. Well, it was a hacker space in the suburbs of Paris, inside an old train depot, a train service building. It was as punk as you could get. I mean, it was really a basement of a dilapidated building next to the, next to the railway and next to a chemical factory. And uh, the f when the factory was active, it would like stink up the whole area with some nasty chemical smell. So, yeah, total cyberpunk atmosphere there. What sort of things did you get up to in, 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 in TMP lab? Uh, should, we, should we go on to another beer? No, no, we shouldn't drink too much. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. What we did there, uh, there, was, there was the Hackerspace Festival, which was quite an amazing party. Like, so many people came there and uh, from all kinds of backgrounds and even from all over Europe, even U US, some people came there. It was like a whole week of uh, partying and having conferences and stuff like that. It was, it was an amazing experience. Uh, Wasn't EHSM? Uh, this is a conference that you... No, EHSM, EHSM, EHSM it's was not connected uh, it was, it was, It's not connected with this, and the atmosphere was totally different. Okay. So what sort of things were, were, did, did uh, TMP Labs sort of work on? I mean, was it anything notably different from what hackerspaces do nowadays? Uh, I would think it was more punk than most hacker spaces. Define punk. Just by the fact it was part of this kind of uh, squatted. I mean, we didn't pay rent. Uh, it was like. But a didn't you have some sort of agreement with the landlord at the time, right? I'm not exactly sure what, what kind of agreement that was. It, it's actually quite controversial what happened really there. Some people say it's a squat, other people say it's not because there was some kind of, of convention mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's. Also, it's, it's, it's a building that no one wants to be in there because it, it, the building was really trashy. I mean, uh, noxious, it's, noxious yeah, factory well, it was, chemicals. It was, yeah, noxious factory chemical. The building didn't look good. It was in the basement. Uh, there was like lots of humidity and mold and stuff. And um, uh, it was part of an artist collective called Six Bis. So the, the six, whole, six bis, yeah, six bis, yeah. P I S S. B I S. B I S. What does B I S mean? B I S. It's like when you have street number, you have uh, those six, six bis, six ter, the oh. six A, six bis. It's it's like just street numbering, and they use the street number as the name of the artist collective. Okay. And uh, because it was a huge building, like uh, uh, there were like I don't know maybe twenty artist workshops in there, and we got one of the spaces there for free. Or this without rent because uh, it was squatting uh i don't really know what the exact status was i mean okay it seems kind of, i mean technically you could say you could say it's a squat because we weren't paying any rent uh but why us and what and why not someone else and what kind of deal did some people make with the artists to get that space and what kind of of deal did the artists make with the landlord uh, to get the space for free i mean it's it's a bit of a you know kind of a muddy waters there lots of personal connections and politics and whatnot um, so that's why the squat status is a bit controversial in this space but you have a bit of a background with squats don't you <laughs> a bit just a bit <laughs> I mean, because you've got a bit of a creative streak. So, I mean, like, you found, you found that by going to squats and checking them out, you sort of met very like-minded individuals over there, didn't you? Mm, 
Kind of. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say like-minded. I met interesting individuals. I don't know if it was like-minded. Okay. But I mean, squats are very much a European thing. I mean, oh, oh, well, sure, you can get people squatting buildings everywhere and anywhere. But, well, if you but like in Hong Kong, you, you try squat why? a building? Oh. Uh, I don't know, actually. Hong Kong has an interesting... Uh, actually, I think you could squat in Hong Kong. Actually. I'm, I'm, you, you think know, you could, eh? Well, just look at the protest movement, all the crazy shit they've been up to. Uh, they just, ah, okay. Just, uh, yeah, if, yeah, but if, this if is only a recent endeavor, right? So we've new, new uncovering yeah, of what... Yeah, the, the roots are there. And... Uh, <laughs> The thing is that if you squat in Hong Kong, probably you just wouldn't tell anyone, and that's why we don't know about it. But look at look at uh, so boring this this vegetarian restaurant or the the the, the collective that was there, the, the Black Window Info Shop, those places, Taxi Hong Lane in, in yeah, Yomate. Yeah. Uh, you find this. So, kind so of just a bit of a background for our audience. Um, um, after was it 2014? I think it was 2014. There was a, a series of protests that happened out here in Hong Kong when when uh, protesters came uh, took to the streets and. And shortly after that, um, sort of a collective called So Boring, which was a restaurant. That was already before the protests. Oh, was that before the oh, 2014 yeah, was, yeah. protests? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So maybe an element of... Uh, well, okay. All right. We came, we came across So Boring after the 2014 protests. I came across it before, but... Uh, was it before? Yeah. When did I meet you? What year? Uh, I think I discovered so boring like maybe two weeks after arriving in Hong Kong or something like that. Two weeks after? Yeah, it was right. one of the first things I found. And then did you discover the hackerspace here in Hong Kong about... about around the same time, yeah. Around the same time. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I remember. You were, you were going in. You were going into like, you know, come on, let's go to so boring. Let's go to so boring. And we went to so boring and... It was so boring. It was boring. <laughs> <laughs> it come was it was boring. Wasn't, it wasn't that boring. <laughs> ah, come on. It was boring. Mind you, they did have the... Um, there was this Black, black Panther. Panthers. Yeah. yeah. They had like, you know, <laughs> some Black Panther dude. He came around and gave yeah. a talk. And he was like talking about how he capped a cop. And we were like, whoa, hello. <laughs> that, that was quite an interesting yep, experience, yep, yep. that was. Good grief. But uh, back then in Tak Chiang Lane, there was lots of stuff. Where? Like, Tak Chiang Lane. This, this, this is a street in Yomate. There was Pitt, oh, Street, yeah. Pitt Street and Tak Chiang Lane. Yeah, Pitt Street. Those, those, yeah. those, two, those two streets, they were full of spaces like this. Like at, I think at the peak, there were like maybe four or five of those, of those areas. Like some, some of them were quite big. Yeah. Uh, they all closed except one, as far as I know. Like the yeah. Black Window uh, yeah. is still there and it has absorbed so boring. But all the other stuff is gone now, as far as I can tell. It's not much of a market for this sort of... Uh uh, I think I think there is a market. It's just that people have tried this and then they moved on. Uh, I mean, look, just look at the protests and all all the stuff that's brewing in in, in Hong Kong. It's, it's I, I think there is a market for this. It's just uh, they just thought that this kind of European style, kind of European style thing, is not the right thing to do, and and then they did something else. But I'm pretty sure it still exists in Hong Kong. It's, it's probably very hidden and. Uh, Mm -hmm. something that they want to talk about in the first place, but I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure there are tons mm -hmm. of squatter type of thing here happening. I mean, there's all sorts of abandoned buildings, like just there or next to the um, the FCC, the Foreign Correspondence yeah, Club. The They've Central got that hospital, abandoned yeah. hospital, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yes. And if you explore that place, I mean, that that's that's just like... Yeah, but it's, it's too central. I mean, you can't really squat it. No, no, it's yeah, too central. Sure. Uh, but the building next to it is also seems to be abandoned, right? Yes. yes. Again, it's too central. And the problem right now is this thing is, is just next to the government house, so there are cops uh, guarding the area. <laughs> and uh, actually, I tried going there like, uh, when was that? Three days ago, and uh, the, cops, the cops were still there, so they've been there for months. Okay, so the cops are guarding well because they got so the cops. The, co the, co the, co the cops are guarding the government Remember house. Remember, we went but there. But the problem is that when you start nosing around the hospital, the cops are going to go for you and ask you questions. So it doesn't work. Yeah, we went there. We went there about actually it was a couple of months now ago. Mm -hmm. A couple of months ago. Yeah, yeah. We were about to go into that building, mm -hmm. and I noticed why is there a tent? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's still there. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I and then and I saw I saw our friend going in. I'm like, hey, wait, sh sh stop, stop! And whoops, there's cops. Mm -hmm. the cops. And then we, we we took a walk around that whole entire government area. Yeah, full of cops. Cops everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cops are everywhere. Watching watching their their government overlords, watching mm -hmm. them carefully, looking after them. That's interesting, man. 
what's going on here in Hong Kong at the moment. It's really interesting. I don't know what's gonna well, what's gonna happen with Hong Kong. Are you thinking of moving out? Or are you gonna stay? I mean, what's 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 your? I don't know where to go. Yeah, nor do I. Eh? Mm. The thing about Hong Kong is that it can backslide significantly. It can backslide significantly, and it will still be orders of magnitude better than well most of the places I've been to, right? Mm -hmm. In in many different departments and areas, it's just what's going on here in Hong Kong is I love the I love the I love the vibe out here. I love it. I love it. I don't know, hey Singapore. Bit too dry, bro. I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think it's that dry. Really? No. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. What the drama that's going on in Hong Kong is something else. I mean, yeah. Bro. Well, I mean, it's it's getting on for about ten o'clock now. When did we start? Uh, we it's been going for one hour and a half, I think. Something else. Yeah, I think we can probably wrap this up. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to sort of discuss? Mm, no, not really. All right. So I found that I need to give myself at least a good four seconds before I have to exit this these processes. Quick, 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 dude! Take your freaking meat grinder and shove it up your ass. <laughs> All right. Okay. So three, four. Thank you, Sebastian. I really cool. appreciate that, man.